But what I was gonna talk about today are top five tips for treating your poisoned feline patient. And in full financial disclosure, before I begin, I am an independent contractor for multiple companies that you see on the screen right here. So what are we gonna talk about in the next hour, two hours? We're gonna talk about the unique characteristics of cats and why they are more exposed to toxicants as compared to dogs. Now, according to the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center, 90% of the calls to APCCs are dogs. And I always joke, they're usually Labrador retrievers. But of the 10% of calls that go to cats or involve cats, they are potentially more dangerous. And that's because of some of the unique characteristics that we'll talk about. So altered glucuronidation, different types of hemoglobin. So we'll talk about that. I also did want to touch on the top five feline poisons because this is really important for you to be aware of. Now, most of you guys already know about lilies since Easter just happened. Hopefully you weren't too bombarded with all the Easter lily calls, but I'm going to go over the top five feline poisons. Now, most of the time, you're probably shocked because cats are so hard to pill, but 50% of the poisonings in cats, according to the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center, are human medications. So SSRIs, amphetamines, these unusual prescription antidepressants or ADD medications, they have some weird odor or smell that actually makes cats look for these medications. So really important that you be cognizant of these dangers. The third aspect that we're gonna talk about in this webinar is what emetic agents we're gonna use for cats at home versus at the clinic. Just in case you fall asleep, there is no safe emetic agent you can tell your cat owner to use at home. They just have to come straight into the veterinary clinic. They cannot use hydrogen peroxide. You are not allowed to have your CSR or your front desk staff say, oh, give them a couple of you know, teaspoons of hydrogen peroxide. That is potentially deadly. I've had a handful of cats die from getting at home hydrogen peroxide. So no safe emetic owner, no safe emetic agents for cat owners to use at home. They have to just come straight to the veterinary clinic. Please make sure your front desk staff know that. As for emetic agents that we're gonna use at the veterinary clinic, please don't use apomorphine. Please don't use hydrogen peroxide. The only ones that truly work include alpha adrenergic drugs like dexmedetomidine or xylazine, or some opioids like hydromorphone. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. We're also gonna focus on how to give activated charcoal to a cat. It's hard to do, but I'm gonna give you a couple of tips on how it can be easier and why this is really important. I'm a firm believer that even with ingestion of a lily plant, you've induced vomiting, you're not positive if there's any leaves uh, left in the stomach, it is still worth giving one dose of charcoal to. And most of the time, I'm only giving one or two doses of charcoal to a cat. We all know it's really hard to get charcoal into a cat. So even if it's a drug that undergoes enterohepatic recirculation, like an NSAID, most of the time, I'm going to give four doses in a dog. You'll be lucky if you can get two doses or maybe three doses in, in a cat. So again, one to two doses is really important. And then I'm going to conclude with how you can make the visit less stressful for your cat patients. This is really important. I don't know if you guys are fear-free or not, but I'm gonna talk about how we can implement this in the poisoned patient. Now, what are some of the unique characteristics about cats? They're hard to pill, but again, they like to chew on human medications. They love to chew on plants. And I'm gonna talk about some poisonous ones like lilies, but I'm also gonna talk about a few that you can blow off. Cat gets into a bunch of insoluble calcium oxalate, it's not a big deal. You don't actually need to see them at your clinic. So we'll talk about that. We're gonna talk again about the unique characteristics of inducing emesis and then species differences. Please know that xylitol is not poisonous to cats. So they've done studies on it. Xylitol is not poisonous to cats, which is good because cats don't chew gum anyway. But we don't actually know about vitis species, grapes or raisins. The good thing about cats is they don't gorge 
They're not the type that they're going to eat 20 pieces of gum. They're not going to eat 20 raisins most of the time. So again, we don't know for sure, but we know there's definitely some species differences that we have to be aware of. Now, what about altered glucuronidation? We know that cats have decreased ability to metabolize certain drugs. So what may be non-toxic to a dog is actually often toxic to a cat. Classic example, owner has a bunch of laundry detergent in their room. And in the laundry room, somebody spilled over some Tide or all or whatever you're using. Dog walks through it, licks it, not a big deal. You wash your clothes in it. You get some on your hands, who cares? Cat walks through it, grooms it off their fur, licks it off. It could potentially be corrosive. And again, that's because of their altered glucuronidation. They also have limited sulfation in their liver. They're more prone to oxidative injury because their hemoglobin contains eight sulfhydryl groups versus four in most other species. And because they're cats, they're going to have weird idiosyncratic drug reactions compared to other species. And the two biggest drugs I worry about are cats and NSAIDs. Now, cats are typically twice as sensitive to NSAIDs as dogs are, and you can use as much, uh, as much parenteral benzodiazepines as you want in cats, but chronic oral benzodiazepines are a huge no-no. And that's because very rarely we can see acute hepatic necrosis from it or almost fulminant liver failure. So please be aware these are some of the unique characteristics of cats that we have to be aware of. Now, you can see on this slide here, these are the top 10 poisons from the ASPCA from two years ago, and this includes cats. So number one are over-the-counter medications. Number two are human prescription medications. So 50% of the calls to ASPCA are human medications. So just be aware of that. Third, food, third toxin is food. Again, less common in cats because they don't gorge the way dogs do. But we do have to be aware of the potential dangers of owners accidentally uh, using products like onion powder or garlic powder chronically in cats. Four, cats don't eat chocolate, so never a big deal. In 20 years plus of practicing, I've only seen one or two cats get into chocolate. Five, veterinary products. This is a big issue. Please remember, if you're dispensing chewable NSAID, whatever brand you're using, please make sure you're aware that you tell your owners how palatable it is to dogs and cats. I can't tell you how many cases I see where a pet owner threw in a chewable carprofen into their dog's food, cat walks by the dog bowl, eats it, and is poisoned. Or the dog owner puts it in a pill pocket, cat walks by and eats it. So please make sure that your pet owners know how palatable some of these chewable products are. And remember, child-proof doesn't mean pet-proof. So when you're sending home a canine patient post-spay or post-neuter with a bunch of chewable NSAID, you better make sure they're keeping it out of reach for both dogs and cats. Six, household items. This is definitely an, an issue with cats. Remember, something is simple as laundry detergent can be corrosive. Something as simple as liquid potpourri, what people use in the fall uh, on a simmer pot to help release the smell of pumpkin or you know evergreen during the holidays, that's corrosive to a cat. So we definitely wanna be careful about that. Seven, rodenticides. Thankfully, relatively rare in our cats. And you guys should all know that the EPA has removed the prevalence of anticoagulant rodenticides. So you should be reaching for your vitamin K1 less frequently. And instead, the EPA has um, mandated the use of two other drugs or two other active ingredients, which are bromethylin and cholecalciferol. Now, I will say cats have evolved to be pretty resistant to anticoagulant rodenticides, which is good because none of your cat owners can pill a cat twice a day for 30 days with vitamin K. But there's a narrower margin of safety with bromethylene and cholecalciferol in cats. So just be aware, I never advocate for any type of rodenticide in any pet owner household. I also think it's inhumane to let a mouse or rat slowly bleed out or go into kidney failure, or seizures its brain, seizure its brains out from cerebral edema. So uh, we as veterinary professionals shouldn't be advocating for rodenticides. Ideally snap traps or adopt more cats instead. 
eight insecticides. I'll definitely talk about this because it's pyrethrin season, or hopefully will be, uh, depending on how this Minnesota thaw goes. Plants, indoor and outdoor plants, as well as bouquets. I hate lily toxicity. Um, I'll talk about this more when we talk about our top five poisons, but the reason why I hate this poison is because the kitten that I gave my big sister, her cat actually died of aneuric renal failure with a creatinine of 22 in congestive heart failure from lilies. And her roommate's boyfriend had sent a bouquet and unfortunately uh, ended up resulting in toxicity in my sister's cat. So again, a really bad poisoning that we still see quite a bit nowadays. I remember last Easter on our intake census at AERC, uh, we had six cats from different households all presenting for Easter lily toxicity. So again, please be aware of these dangers. We definitely wanna educate our owners about these risks. And 10, garden products. Uh, people are just starting to garden. Please be aware. We want to keep these out of reach. Um, this is more of a dog thing, honestly, so not going to be a huge, huge deal. But again, I do definitely worry about this more in uh, canine households or Labrador retriever households. All right. So what are the top five feline poisons? Again, Top one is SSRI antidepressants. And I'll talk about this, but if you see any feline patients, you better pay attention to the drug Effexor. There is some weird odor or smell in the drug Effexor that makes cats want to chew this stuff up. So we definitely see a lot of um, antidepressant toxicity. So have to be cognizant of that. The second toxicant that I see a lot, again, lilies. I'm going to talk about this. I'm also going to talk about a few non-toxic plants that you can blow off. Liquid potpourri, glow jewelry, pyrethrins and pyrethroids. And again, some of these you can potentially manage at home. Some of these you must absolutely see and treat immediately for life-saving care. So again, definitely want to make sure your pet owners are educated about these dangers. All right, so let's start with antidepressants. The first antidepressant that I wanted to talk about, again, SSRIs, these are typically selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There's also SSNIs. Um, these are less common. There's tricyclic antidepressants. We actually use some of these in veterinary medicine. We use Prozac for cats that are aggressive or peeing outside of the litter box. But with massive ingestion, they can be poisonous. So just be aware. Uh, remember, the most common type that we worry about in cats is venlafaxine or Effexor XR, but you can see some of the most common SSRI brands listed up here. Now, how exactly do these drugs work? Now, SSRIs work by inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin at the presynaptic membrane. This is going to result in more serotonin being present, which in a human is supposed to make them happier, but unfortunately ends up resulting in serotonin syndrome in our veterinary patients. And so classic signs of serotonin syndrome in a cat are typically agitation, tachycardia, hypertension, mydriasis. So again, classic serotonin syndrome. It's going to be a super pissed off cat that comes into your clinic with dilated pupils, flicking its ears, fluffed tail, extra aggressive, tachycardic, hypertensive, and can potentially tremor and seizure. One pill is toxic in a cat. And again, that weird odor does really make cats ingest it. So how are we going to treat this? If the cat is asymptomatic, in other words, the cat just got into it, the owner witnessed it, the cat's TPR is normal, his blood pressure is normal, in that scenario, I may induce emesis. My general rule, and I'll talk about this more with emesis induction, is please don't waste more than 15 minutes trying to get a cat to vomit. If you've tried, there's no vomit, it's not worth continuing. Just move on to activate charcoal. Give a potent antiemetic like meropitin after you've tried inducing emesis, and then go ahead and give activated charcoal. The next part of mainstay therapy is going to be fluid therapy and sedatives like acepromazine or butorphanol to relieve some of the anxiety that we can see in cats. We want to make sure to monitor their blood pressure and their ECG. Now, do I keep these guys on a continuous ECG? Absolutely not. But 
I am making sure to do a TPR on them every two to four hours, depending on how symptomatic they are. My magical number in cats is I care when it's greater than 220. If they're tachycardic greater than 220, their blood pressure systolic is greater than 200, 220, they definitely need some type of drug in order to treat that hypertension and tachycardia. And I'll talk about it more, but my go-to drug is actually acepromazine. You can use this in cats. Um, I usually will start at low dose 0.05. In really severe cases, there are reports of using 0.1 mg per kg IV. So just be aware. Obviously, you want to monitor their blood pressure very carefully. If they do show neurologic signs like tremors or seizures, reaching for whatever you have in your kitchen sink. So methocarbamol, IV, phenobarbital IV, IV Valium, whatever you have. I will say I'm a huge advocate of making sure that you have an injectable bottle of methocarbamol in your clinic. And the main reason why is because you're going to use it on all the poisoning cases in your clinic. There are so many toxicants that cause tremors, and that's why you have to have injectable methocarbamol. So classic reason why I am concerned is because of half the toxins I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes, they usually require some kind of IV methocarbamol. If you have a pyrethrin cat that's tremoring, or you have a really severe venlafaxine cat that is tremoring, you can't pill them a 250 mg tablet of methocarbamol. It's not going to kick in fast enough. Um, some people will say, oh, I just crush it up and give it rectally. It's still not fast enough. And that's why I'm actually a huge advocate that you make sure that you have injectable methocarbamol. Again, I promise once you have it, you're going to use it more. The last part of mainstay therapy is actually going to be the old appetite stimulant, ciproheptadine or periactin. We still have this, even though now we use mirtazapine, but ciproheptadine is actually a serotonin antagonist. So it's the perfect drug for a cat that has too much serotonin. So my cat dose is two to four migs total every six to eight to 12 hours, a very, very safe drug. So when in doubt, definitely worth using. I actually published a study, uh, gosh, almost 10 years ago now or seven years ago now, where I retrospectively looked at 33 cases of cats that got into SSRIs. And thankfully, the prognosis was excellent. 100% of the cats survived. Cats that did develop symptoms had resolution of clinical signs. And on average, the mean hospitalization for all the cats was about 14 hours. Um, the number one drug that cats got into was Effexor followed by Prozac. And about one out of every four cats became symptomatic. 75% of cats were asymptomatic, probably due to appropriate decontamination. Now, I just told you serotonin syndrome is usually that tachycardic, pissed off, hypertensive cat. I will say cats versus dogs. Dogs usually become very, very agitated with serotonin syndrome. Some cats can actually become the opposite. They become very, very sedate instead of wiggity. So just be aware of that. Cats sometimes will uh, respond a little bit differently. All right. The next toxicant I wanted to talk about are lilies. I don't ask that you be a botanist, but I do ask that you make sure that you feel comfortable identifying lilies. Why? The main reason why is because they are so poisonous. Two to three leaves, even the pollen, even the stem, even the leaves can be deadly. So what do we need to know? First of all, I wanted to talk about one study by Slatter um, and Sharon Gowaltney Brandt that came out of ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center about nine years ago. This study actually broke my heart because this is an, old, uh, an older study. Um, it happened, gosh, a decade ago. But in this study, 69% of cat owners said they could identify a lily. That's incredible. If I surveyed 100% of vets, I can guarantee you 69% couldn't identify a lily but only 27% knew that lilies were toxic before their cat vomited it up or had exposure. This study is only 10 years old. And with social media and the internet and your blogs and your websites, our pet owners should know that lilies are poisonous. Most of the lilies were obtained in a grocery store. Sometimes they were gifts. And unfortunately, most owners were unaware of it until they Googled it later. 
Thankfully, 93% received prompt veterinary care and only 5% had evidence of renal failure at follow-up. Another 5% were euthanized due to renal failure. So this study broke my heart and then it basically told us our pet owners still don't know that lilies are poisonous. At AERC, before COVID-19, we actually have fake silk lilies taped to our pens at the front desk so our pet owners don't steal our pens, but more importantly, so they recognize what a lily looks like. And then we have a big sign that says, these plants are deadly. Please do not have them in a cat household. Now, remember, these are only going to be true lilies. These are going to be lilium or hemorrhalis species. So Easter, tiger, stargazer, oriental, some species of daylily, wood, red, and Asiatic. Toxicologists still don't know what the exact toxicant is, but they know it's water soluble, which means if the cat drinks some water out of the vase containing the lilies, it can go into acute kidney failure. If it walks by and gets some of the pollen on its fur, it can develop acute kidney injury. So again, this can be very, very dangerous. It can be really, really toxic. It only takes a tiny amount to result in toxicity. This is a Peruvian lily, and this is not actually toxic. This is just gonna cause mild vomiting, mild diarrhea, not a big deal at all. Um, but this is one of the reasons why we do not have pet owners explain what a pet looks like on the phone. It's yellow with brown dots and a little bit pink. No, we can't identify a plant that way. So when in doubt, you wanna make sure that they bring in the plant, that you can identify it, they can take it to a florist, they can always call ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center and email the photo. Uh, their medical director, uh, Tina Weismer, is a master gardener. She can identify anything. This is a tiger lily. This is a first to bloom, typically the end of May in Minnesota. Um, I don't like this lily. It's tall, it's spindly, it's ugly. It grows to be two to four feet tall. Um, if you look at the dried bud um, that you can see on the left side of the screen, that's actually used in Chinese cooking. Uh, so growing up as a kid, I always hated the taste of tiger lily and stir fry. They taste disgusting and rubbery. Um, Again, totally safe for humans to eat, but deadly for cats. The oriental lily, pink, white, yellow, they come in any color. They usually have a huge bloom, usually at least six inches or approximately five to six inches in, in width. They have a very tall stamen. They have a very light fragrant smell and their bloom lasts a long time, which is why they're the number one flower that's used in a florist bouquet. Now, please keep in mind and make sure your CSR are appropriately trained. I've seen the accident where people have had their CSR tell pet owners the wrong lily being poisonous. Calla lily, lily in the valley, peace lily are not true lilies. If you look at their um, Latin name, they are not lilium or hemorrhalis. They're poisonous in their own way, but they do not cause direct nephrotoxicity. So please be aware, these types are not nephrotoxic. So what clinical signs are we going to see? Typically, the first sign we're going to see is actually vomiting, which is fantastic because that's when pet owners will be like, oh, I put it in the area where my can't, cat can't get into it and you vomited up a leaf and that's where they call you. So they will usually vomit within one to two hours. They can start to show depression and then they start to show azotemia at 12 to 24 hours. In general, the prognosis is excellent for lily toxicity as long as they're making urine and not azotemic. Now, I'm gonna say fair to a pet owner. I'm gonna say excellent to you as a colleague because if you can get them decontaminated and started on fluids right away, the prognosis is excellent. So don't give up on these guys. So how are we gonna treat them? In general, what we're gonna do is we're gonna decontaminate them even if they already vomited because they may still have leaves in their stomach. So emesis induction, if it's recent ingestion within a few hours, one dose of activated charcoal, please give them one dose of meropitant before you give them the charcoal so they don't vomit and they hold it down. And as soon as I'm done inducing emesis and I feel like my uh, patient has vomited, I will give the meropitant IV immediately and start the charcoal within 10 to 15 minutes, not an hour later, that's too late. Okay, so start it right away. Next thing we're gonna do, baseline blood work. Jody Lulich will yell at you and hunt you down and find you if you do not get a urine-specific gravity on this cat before you start fluids. 
So please, please, please try to get a UA before IV fluids. We want to make sure they're not isosinuric. And we want to make sure they have normal renal function and they can concentrate prior to fluid therapy. Now, when I say fluid therapy, I want to make sure that you understand that's not sub-Q fluids. Sub-Q fluids doesn't cut it. These are cases that need to be referred to AERC for 48 hours of IV fluids. Even IV fluids during the day, sub-Q fluids at night is not ideal. Um, and the main reason why is I really want to diuresis, guys, for a full 48 hours. Antiemetics, monitoring urine output, doing daily blood work. So initially on presentation, I usually will get a mini chem, PCV, total solids, urine-specific gravity, and UA. Thereafter, I'm going to do a daily renal panel and a PCV total solids every day for two days. If it's normal, I send them home. I have them come back on the third day just to recheck to be safe again. Now, do I put a urinary catheter in every single one of these guys? Absolutely not. But you better make sure that you're palpating their bladder at least every two to four hours. They better be peeing. If they're not peeing, you're either putting them on a flu wimpy fluid rate where they're not making urine, or they're becoming more azotemic and oliguric or anuric. So I usually put them on two and a half times maintenance. And this is important because we want to prevent them from becoming azotemic. Ultimately, the prognosis is excellent with symptomatic supportive care. Now, there was a study that was done by Bennett and Reinecke, and what they actually found was that with decontamination and aggressive fluid therapy, the prognosis was excellent in a study that was done at University of Pennsylvania. It was grave if the cats were aneuric, were azotemic, or if the pet owner waited more than 18 hours prior to seeking veterinary attention. That doesn't mean that if a case calls you at 4 a.m., you say, ah, just come in at 8 a.m. They need to be seen right away. So please be aware of that. But in general, the prognosis is good if treated early. In the study that was published at a pen, 100% of cats survived to discharge. 75% of cats had a normal BUN and creatinine. 10% of cats were more azotemic. Um, but this generally shows that the prognosis is fair to excellent. So again, don't give up on the, these lily cases. Now, what about plants you can blow off? You can blow off certain plants. Now, if you go to the ASPCA Animal Poison Control website, they have a great poisonous plants page, but unfortunately, it makes it look like every single plant is poisonous, even catnip. So that one is a little bit over the top, but I will say the majority of toxic plants are going to be on one hand in a cat. It's going to be lilies. It's going to be weird aminata mushrooms, which cats don't eat anyway. It's going to be weird cardiac glycosides, which cats don't usually gorge on. It's going to be blue-green algae, although I've never heard of a cat getting into it because they're not usually outside licking dirty water. So again, those are usually the deadly ones. Um, insoluble calcium oxalates are definitely plants that um, are a common ingestion by cats because these are common house plants. These are house plants where they can live in Minnesota winter, they barely need any light, they start to dry up, the pet owner hasn't watered it in two months, it's turning brown. You just add some water and boom, they pop back up to green. They don't have any leaf, they don't have any flowers. Um, they're just really um, beautiful green succulent plants, or not succulent, they're a little bit thick leafed. Um, this is of the Diffenbachia species. And if you've ever gone to Costa Rica or Puerto Rico in the winter, this is what makes up and comprises a lot of the rainforest. So really common house plant. They're really hard to kill. They come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, they come in long variated forms. So yellow, green, white, and green, but they're usually really viney. So you can cut off some of the cuttings, put them in a vase for two years. They'll grow some roots. Uh, water dries up. They're still growing. So again, really hard to kill. Some other types of insoluble calcium oxalate include the calla lily, the beautiful white flower you see on the top of the screen. This is often used in wedding bouquets. Uh, and again, this one is not a true lily, so it's not nephrotoxic. The mother-in-law's tongue, which you can see uh, right in the middle, this is a very, very tall plant. It's a household plant that grows three to five feet tall. It's very thick. It's almost got this waxy feel. It's got yellow margins on the side, um, and it's long and lashing like your mother-in-law's tongue. 
the peace lily, the third picture you see on the screen. This is kind of an ugly lily. Um, the white flower looks very similar to the green leaf, but it's white. It's got a huge stamen. It's very water loving. It's very commonly found in hotels. It doesn't need a lot of light. Um, again, it's an insoluble calcium oxalate. The Diffenbachia, the umbrella plant, the pothos, the elephant ear. Again, these are all really common insoluble oxalates. So why do we care? We care because they look bad. Cats will get into it and they start foaming and frothing at the mouth. They start pawing. They get oral pharyngeal edema. They look like this cat here. But again, it's not a big deal. If you've ever eaten raw uh, spinach salad and you chew on the spinach, some people will get this chalky taste in your mouth and that's because of insoluble and soluble oxalates. It's basically these raphite crystals that are scraping the inside of the mouth. Not a big deal. Give the cat something tasty to drink, like milk, yogurt, something like that. Flush out the mouth, have them drink some canned tuna water, not oil. And again, most of these can be managed at home. If the cat happens to come into your clinic, then that's a scenario where most of the time you can flush out the mouth, you can give some fluid therapy, sub-Q, an antiemetic, and they'll be fine. Of course, there's that one dog that is going to be a bad beagle. I'm pretty sure this one was a beagle. Um, most of the time, I blow off Diffenbachia. It's not a big deal. But there was one case that was treated in Milwaukee uh, where a dog upper airway obstructed and needed a temporary tracheostomy from getting into Diffenbachia. So just warn the owner. Very rarely, they get oral pharyngeal edema. But most of the time, it's just an immediate irritant. The key thing you need to keep in mind is that there's a difference between insoluble and soluble. Now, we just talked about insoluble, and I always remember that as it's, the plant isn't being absorbed. That's different than soluble. Soluble can be absorbed, and it includes these three pictures of plants here. Soluble oxalate-containing plants are super, super rare, but they contain oxalic acid and oxalate salts. They're very different from insoluble, and these include rhubarb, starfruit, and shamrock. We all love to eat rhubarb pie in the summer. You can eat the stalk, but you cannot eat the leaf, which is poisonous, okay? If you have the household plant shamrock or English shamrock, it's usually green or purple with this really pretty centered um, white flower. Um, that is also a soluble oxalate containing plant. The star fruit, which is a fantastic, delicious tropical fruit, um, there are reports in human medicine of people going on a cruise to a tropical area, eating star fruit. These are people who had chronic renal failure and were on dialysis, and they go into acute kidney failure from eating star fruit. So it's definitely published. You definitely have to be aware of it. But to me, this is so rare in small animal medicine. This is more of a large animal thing. Cattle that are chronically grazing on rhubarb, this can happen too, and it's been published. Again, very, very rare in small animal medicine, but just be aware because acute kidney injury can be seen with large ingestions. So what am I worried about? I'm worried about chronic renal insufficiency patients, a 15-year-old cat that is chronic renal failure, that's hyperthyroid, that's dehydrated, gets and chews into a shamrock plant. I'm going to treat that patient. Okay, so I'm going to treat that one a little more aggressively. And the main reason why is because of mechanism of action. Now, what's going to happen is this plant is going to be absorbed from the gut. It's going to bind with the systemic calcium. It's going to result in a systemic oral, hyp uh, sorry, in a uh, systemic acute hypocalcemia. And it's kind of going to act like ethylene glycol toxicity. It's going to cause calcium oxalate crystals to accumulate in the kidneys, resulting in acute kidney injury. Now, in 20 plus years, I've never seen a, a small animal, dog or cat, develop acute kidney injury from soluble calcium oxalate, but you have to be aware of it. So not that common, but more dangerous. Classic signs we're going to see with this, drooling, anorexia, vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, very rarely, titan, uh, titanic tremors from hypocalcemia. You can see renal failure at 24 to 48 hours. Again, you're going to treat it mostly same exact thing as lily toxicity. So emesis induction, if appropriate, one dose of activated charcoal, blood work. So ideally a CBC chem, a UA before you do any fluids, fluid therapy for 24, 48 hours, antiemetics, symptomatic supportive care. And thankfully the prognosis should be excellent with supportive care.
All right, last couple of toxins and then we'll bring it home uh, with how to induce emesis. Liquid potpourri. I already talked about this one. Again, this is more common during the holidays uh, when people actually use a simmer pot to heat up um, sort of this ball of wax of potpourri. I'm not talking about dry potpourri sitting on top of the toilet or on top of your living room table. That's not a big deal, but it's heated potpourri. These contain cationic detergents and in high concentrations are corrosive to cats. They can actually result in drooling, ulcers, tachypnea. Very rarely, they can result in acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is the shock organ of the cat. Very rarely, it can cause hepatotoxicity, although this is really rare. So a Glade plug-in that contains essential oils, that's totally different. Okay, that's not a big deal. It's overhyped in the news. That's not a big deal. It's truly liquid potpourri or concentrated essential oils we worry about. Next one we worry about, glow jewelry. This happens during the holidays, during Halloween, during the summer, during July 4th. This is when a cat chews into those plastic uh, bracelets that children will wear or people will wear for, uh, during the holidays. It contains DBT, this oily, bitter liquid. It makes the cat foam and froth and look terrible. Not a big deal. You don't even need to see this at your vet clinic. You can just flush out the mouth. I usually have the owners turn off the lights to see if their cat is glowing in the dark from getting dermal exposure. If they do notice that there's this glowing liquid in the dark, please make sure to bathe them with a liquid dish soap like Dawn to get the product off. Give them some tasty tuna, and honestly, they're going to be just fine. All right, let's talk about the last toxicant, pyrethrins and pyrethroids, what we're going to be seeing within the next month. Now, everything on this slide that you see here is totally safe to use on a cat. That's right. Sargent's flea and tick shampoo for dogs, flea spray for dogs, tick spray for dogs, Raid Max Bug Barrier. Yes, I've had the random owner that will spray it on their cat because of fleas. This is designed to kill bugs outside. Um, obviously, we don't want to use this on a cat, but these products that you see on the screen are all low concentration products. What do I mean? Well, first of all, it's the dose that makes the poison. I'm going to show this video here. And this is a classic presentation of a cat that has a high concentration pyrethroid applied to it. This is a well-intentioned cat owner who doesn't buy their prescription flea and tick medication from you. They go to Walmart or Walgreens and they buy small dog flea and tick product for a cat and they put it on. This can be fatal without treatment please treat these guys. The prognosis is excellent with supportive care. I hate seeing these. Um, these are one of the reasons why um, the company Bayer renamed Advantix to K9 Advantix because they wanted to reiterate it's for dogs, right? So any high concentration product that's a flea and tick pyrethrin that's meant for dogs can be fatal to a cat with accidental administration. So what are we going to see? Well, here's my first clue. Please have the owner bring the container in or look at the container yourself. When you look at some of these products, if you go to the active ingredients, the biggest thing to keep in mind is anything that ends with a thrin is a pyrethrin, okay? Pyrethrins are an, a chemical derivative from the chrysanthemum or mum flower, super, super safe to use on dogs. And cats tolerate a one to 5% concentration. So most of these insecticides are less than 1%. Here you can see there's other ingredients. They're all inert ingredients. Little clue, we don't care about inert ingredients. So this one you can spray on a cat. It's not a big deal. Again, please don't do that. But this one is not going to be a big deal if a cat is exposed to it. Here's my little free clue for free poison control advice. When in doubt, please Google EPA Reg Purdue, what you see on the screen. As soon as you Google Purdue EPA Reg, this is gonna bring you to the Purdue University website and you can type in the EPA registration number. If you look on this product, any product that kills anything, kills an ant, roach, mouse, rat, gopher, flea, tick, it is regulated by the EPA. Okay, the Environmental Protection Agency. So there's always full-time free animal poison control associated with that. When you go to this website, you just type in the EPA registration number. You have to be aware it is very sensitive to the dashes. So you have to make sure you're entering it in correctly. But most of the time, it'll take you automatically to the company, their 1-800 number, and what the product contains. So you, now you know what the product is and whether or not it's going to be an issue or not.
Keep in mind again that high concentration pyrethrins, pyrethroids are poisonous to dogs, uh, to cats, not dogs. They're super, super safe in dogs. The low concentration, we don't care about. They're safe even around cats. So again, ant traps, home insect sprays, shampoos, powders, not a big deal. Cats are more sensitive to pyrethrins and pyrethroids because of their altered glucuronidation. So again, cats usually tolerate less than a 5%. Greater than 5%, we're going to see toxicity, but dogs tolerate it really well. So what do you do if a cat comes in tremoring or seizuring from having a high concentration flea and tick product on? Please do not bathe them right away. Seizuring, tremoring cats don't want to be stressed out by you bathing them. Knock them out first. So use a, lateral, uh, use a medial saphenous, bolus them with a butterfly catheter, 50 mg per kg of IV methocarbamol, which is why you need injectable methocarbamol in your clinic. Sedate them and then you bathe them, okay? So keep in mind cats develop systemic toxicity with high concentration pyrethrins. They may start to foam and froth at the mouth. They'll hypersalivate. That's usually from the alcohol carrier. The facial twitching will start. And please be aware clinical signs progress to the tail. Then their cutaneous trunk eye starts tremoring. Then their body starts tremoring. Clinical signs resolve actually the other way from tail to head. So the facial twitching is the first clinical sign to develop and usually the last clinical sign to go away. Now, how are we going to treat these cats? Look at the concentration. If it's less than 1%, please don't torture the cat by bathing it. Okay, it's not going to be a big deal. If it's a high concentration product, then again, sedate the cat with IV methocarbamol, bathe them with a liquid dish soap like Dawn. Dawn is my favorite. I do full body three times in a row, except for the head. Um, and once I'm finished bathing them, I'll dry them off, I'll thermoregulate them, I'll get IV access. I'll continue them on IV methocarbamol as needed, excuse the typo in that, um, and then I will make sure to keep them on IV fluids or sub-Q fluids. Please keep in mind that IV di diazepam does not work as well. So that's why I really want you guys to have methocarbamol in your clinic. All right, so that covers the top five poisons that you're going to see in the hospital. Now, let's focus the last part of the talk on how we decontaminate cats. Now, there's a couple of ways of decontaminating. We already talked about dermal decontamination for high concentration pyrethrins, but don't forget about ocular, inhalational, and gastrointestinal. Ocular decontamination. Cat walks by the oven while the owner is cleaning it. Owner accidentally sprays oven cleaner in the eye of the cat. Before you say, oh, come into the clinic right away, you don't tell them that. You say, flush out the eye with anything that you have at home, visine, saline, contact lens solution, and then get into the clinic. The main reason why is because if your clinic is 30 minutes away, um, by the time they come in, that could have corroded through the cornea. So appropriate ocular decontamination. Now we all know no cat owner can bathe a cat well, no cat owner can flush an eye well, but they have to at least try. So please have them try that. Gastrointestinal decontamination. This is obviously a dog, a Labrador, who ate a bunch of raisins and greenies. Um, but gastrointestinal decontamination is still really important. Now, I joke, how do we induce emesis in cats? My whole house in St. Paul is hardwood floor, of course. The only time my cat vomits is always on the throw rug, which is super annoying. Had to barf, made it to the carpet on time. So, what emetic agents are we going to use in cats? Remember at the beginning of the talk, I said there are absolutely no emetic agents you can use safely at home. Your cat owner just needs to come into the clinic so you can induce emesis at your clinic. Again, please make sure your front desk st staff know it can be fatal if they recommend giving hydrogen peroxide to a cat. We don't do that. Now, I know there is a dose listed in plums for apomorphine in cats. It generally is ineffective. In fact, we don't even bother trying it. We don't recommend using salt anymore. Why? Because most of the time we see dog owners accidentally give too much salt. Um, it's also potentially contraindicated in cats with free water loss. So if they're diabetic, they have renal disease or hyperthyroid. So again, not the best thing. Liquid soap or mustards are generally ineffective. Both human and veterinary medicine does not recommend the use of syrup of Ipecac. I've seen rare fatalities from it. So please be aware uh, we shouldn't be using any of that. So 
why are we not using peroxide? Because anecdotally, the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center sees 25% of cats develop a severe hemorrhagic gastritis from this. It's also not very effective. I have had a handful of cats die from this. I published this with Gulf Coast Veterinary Specialty Clinic in Houston a few years ago in JVAC. And this was a cat that was diabetic. The owner uh, saw it in just a Nerf foam part from a Nerf gun. She gave hydrogen peroxide and then the cat continued to vomit blood when she went in. Um, the cat had to be euthanized on the table because he sloughed a uh, almost 60 to 90% of his stomach, which you can see on the slide here. So can result in severe necroulcerative lesions within the stomach. So what should you use instead? Instead, I'm going to have you use dexmedetomidine. Now, for those of you guys who don't use or don't carry dexmedetomidine or dextomator, I'm going to recommend that you do because with the opioid crisis, um, you are probably going to have a harder time getting opioids. It's a great option to have. I honestly don't use high dose. Um, I usually just use micro doses uh, with butorphanol when I'm trying to sedate a patient in the ER. Um, obviously, this is extra label to use dexmedetomidine as an emetic agent in cats, but it works. So in a paper by Thali and Drobats at the University of Pennsylvania, they found that seven mics per kg IM was quite effective in inducing emesis. Now, previously, the textbooks all said use xylazine at 0.44 mg per kg. I'm not a huge fan of xylazine. It's a large animal drug. Um, and honestly, in the few times I've used it in cats, it worked less than 50% of the time. It makes them so sedate and hypotensive. You almost have to intubate them. But the good thing is both these drugs are totally reversible. So this was a study that was published by Penn. And what they found was that they compared retrospectively cats that had emesis induction with hydrogen peroxide versus with dexmedetomidine. And what they actually found was that um, almost 80% of cats that got dexmedetomidine vomited, which is fantastic. Only about half of the cats that got xylazine vomited, so uh, 44%. None of the cats that got hydrogen peroxide vomited. So, based off this study, um, this showed that dexmedetomidine was the most effective emetic out there. So, definitely worth considering using. Typically, cats would vomit within five to 10 minutes. And the biggest side effect was sedation, which you can totally reverse with uh, adipamazole as needed. Now, later that year, another study came out, and this actually, uh, one of the co-authors was our criticalist at AERC, Tracy Julius. Same exact year, they also compared the use of dexmedetomidine and xylazine and found similar results. Approximately 50% of the cats vomited in the study, 43% with xylazine, so almost identical from the Penn study, and almost 60% with dexmedetomidine. So what does this say? Yes, dexmedetomidine is superior to xylazine. Now, just a couple of years ago, another study came out, and this study compared hydromorphone sub-Q to dexmedetomidine. And they actually found that hydromorphone sub-Q was more effective. 75% of cats vomited with sub-Q hydromorphone at 0.1 mg per kg versus 7 mg per kg of dexmedetomidine IM. So, um, a lot of us are scared to use opioids in cats. You shouldn't be. Uh, but based off this study, I may start using um, hydromorphone sub-Q instead. So this was a really interesting study. It just generally takes a little bit longer. So what if your cat doesn't vomit? You've tried dexmedetomidine. You've given it seven mics per kg. Maybe you try a second dose of three to five mics per kg. It still doesn't vomit. If you wasted more than 20 minutes, my general rule, move on, okay? Give the cat uh, anti-emetic so it stops vomiting, and then take advantage of the sedation. Instead of reversing them right away, please get an IV catheter in, tube them some charcoal, get all the blood work that you need to get, uh, do everything you need to do before you wake up this cat. So again, take advantage of that sedation. Now, a couple of tidbits. I'm going to show some videos. Uh, hopefully, they'll work fine. A um, couple of things with cats. Cats are probably too small to gastric lavage successfully. I've tried it once in a cat. I didn't get anything back. Cats typically won't eat charcoal because it tastes bad. And 
cats will bite through an oral gastric tube. Uh, their sharp canine teeth, their, their sharp incisors can bite through a red rubber. So please be aware if you do try to tube a cat, you must, must, must have something hard and plastic to protect that oral gastric tube. Our syringes at AERC typically have a plastic case around them. So I just use a one mil plastic uh, case cover for a one mil syringe. And I insert my oral gastric tube directly through that to act as a mouth gag. I'll show you some videos so you believe me. All right, next important part of decontamination is actually charcoal. How much charcoal should we be giving cats? And should we be giving it to them? Yes, you should be giving it to them. Now, obviously, again, it's going to be a little bit harder, but I do really want you to try because it beats having a patient go into acute renal failure because you didn't give it charcoal. Now, big misconception I want to talk about. Toxaban is hard to find. If you can get it, great, order it. But you need both red top and blue top Toxaban. The dose listed is 10 to 20 mils per kg. Most cats are five kg, so in general, I usually give 60 mils of Toxaban to a cat. Now, you want both red top and blue top Toxaban because the red top has sorbitol and the blue top does not have sorbitol. My general rule with charcoal is a first dose should always, always, always have sorbitol with it because it acts as a cathartic and helps push the poison bound to the toxicant out of the cat as soon as possible. Now, we actually use UAA gel, Universal Animal Antidote, at AERC. And the dose listed on it is too good to be true. Please be aware the dose listed on it is erroneous. It is wrong, okay? If you actually calculate the dose, the dose is off by fourfold, which means you have to use the same exact dose as Toxaban, or you have to double to quadruple the dose. The emergency doctors that I work with don't even believe me on this. They usually underdose it. You have to quadruple the dose of UAA gel. Okay, it's too good to be true. Since you guys don't believe me, we're gonna be forced to do some math. So this is a brand. I'm not endorsing any of these brands, but this is charcoal with kaolin oral paste. It has 100 mg per mil of activated charcoal. And if you look at the label, it says each mil contains 100 mg of activated charcoal, which is why it's 100 mg per mil. If you look, it says 15 mils per 10 kgs for dogs and cats. You wish. Most cats are five kgs. There's no way you only give 7.5 mils of charcoal to a cat. Life would be awesome. Your technicians would love you, but there's no chance you only give eight mils to a cat. So let's do some math. The dose of charcoal to give to a cat is one to two grams per kg as an oral dose. If we calculate a typical cat being five kgs, their dose is one to two grams per kg, or five times one is five grams per dose, or Double that is 10 grams per dose. When we convert our MIGs um, to our grams to MIGs, that's going to be 5,000 MIGs or 10,000 MIGs. We know there's 100 MIGs per mil of charcoal. So that's 5,000 divided by 100. That's 50 mils. So this, do this dose is off by almost tenfold. So again, either do the hard math or just believe me, you almost always have to give 60 mils of charcoal to a cat. Okay, don't believe the labels. Most of the time they're wrong, um, except with Toxaban. All right, how are we going to give charcoal to a cat? Now, this is a video that one of my colleagues sent. And of course, it's going to be a Labrador retriever. There's barely any food in this bowl and the dog is just chomping away on it. So if a dog will eat charcoal, absolutely let them eat it with food. There are studies that say that show that the more food you give, the more it affects binding. But in general, it's okay to give a small amount of food with charcoal. So not a big deal. What about cats? All right, so I don't know if you guys can hear the sound on this. All right, so 
what you're seeing in this video, um, I apologize, there is sound. So let me just explain what's going on in this video. So in this video, this is a cat that was young that presented to AERC um, in St. Paul. And this was a young cat that got into 200 capsules of vitamin D. And I just told you cats don't gorge. I actually went into the room and I was like, 200 capsules? Yeah, right. And the owner was like, uh-huh. And she showed me the bag. And damn, this cat actually ate 200 capsules of vitamin uh, D. And I was worried about this cat going to hypercalcemia and developing acute kidney injury. So I actually sedated this cat. I gave it seven mics per keg of xylazine. And the cat did vomit up some greasy looking food. The cat was already very sedate from the seven mics per kick of dexmedetomidine. So while it's sedate, try to do everything that you can. So we got an IV catheter in. We got blood work on this cat. And because this cat was sedate, you can see that I'm trying to gastric lavage him. Here, I put in that one mil, uh, it's actually a three mil uh, plastic case here. I put in an eight to 10 French red rubber catheter directly through the center, just in case the cat woke up and bit it. And here, I'm trying to confirm placement of the um, red rubber catheter directly into the esophagus and stomach. Now you saw I was escolting the stomach while I was flushing in some air. The cat is too, too sedate for me to um, be able to uh, flush water in and see if the cat's gonna lick. But I did confirm placement. This cat was so sedate, I actually looked with a laryngoscope so you can uh, make sure that the tube's in the right place. Remember, cats are so hard to intubate. The likelihood you got this 10 French red rubber down the airway is extremely low. but here I tried gastric lavaging, I couldn't get anything in, and I immediately, once I know I'm in the stomach, just uh, flushed in 60 mils of activated charcoal while the cat's sedate. So super easy to do, please make sure um, to go ahead and administer activated charcoal, can be done quite readily, and immediately pulled out the tube, and voila, you just tubed a cat charcoal. So super, super easy. Behold, the unicorn cat that eats activated charcoal. This was a cat that was hospitalized. I can't remember for what, but this cat actually ate its full dose of charcoal. So uh, some cats will actually eat it. If they will eat it, absolutely let them. All right, a couple of rare side effects that you have to be aware of activated charcoal. And I will say I've never seen this in cats. I've only seen this in dogs. Now, very rarely, cats will actually vomit and they can potentially aspirate up the charcoal. So just be aware of that. Very rarely, um, they can become hypernatremic. I've only honestly ever seen this in dogs, not in cats. Um, so again, most of the time when I see hypernatremia, it's our fault. And so in this scenario, when I see it, it's usually when people are inducing vomiting. So a dog has lost some water that way, or they're syringing a bunch of charcoal to a dog and the dog is fighting it. And he's like... <laughs> And panting the whole time and losing a lot of free water by panting. And then we tell the owner, oh, we just gave him, you know, a couple of cans of AD and charcoal and his stomach's going to be upset. No food or water today. And then you just NPO'd the dog and now he's more dehydrated. So how do we avoid that hypernatremia? The biggest thing is making sure that you maintain hydration in this patient and that you give them rapid return to oral water. I clinically, knock on wood, have given charcoal a zillion times, and in zero of my patients have I ever seen hypernatremia. But if you heard me lecture, you guys know that I use aggressive fluid therapy. This is the perfect patient population to use aggressive fluid therapy because most of our poison pets are healthy two-year-old Labradors or relatively healthy uh, young patients. They don't usually have cardiopulmonary disease. So I'm going to avoid that hypernatremia. If I'm treating a patient as a poisoning case outpatient, I'm going to give them sub-Q fluids or I'm going to give them an IV dose of meropatin as soon as I induce emesis, after I'm done inducing emesis, so they have rapid return to oral water. That way the owner can give them a bowl of water right away when they get home. And remember, the kidneys are always going to be smarter than the smartest clinician. So your body is going to detect that hypernatremia. And if you have an appropriate thirst mechanism and access to water, they're not going to get hypernatremic. Okay. If it's an inpatient hospital, the few rare times I see hypernatremia, it's again with multiple doses of charcoal and a dog that doesn't have a water bowl. 
And that's one of my biggest pet peeves is when a dog or a cat doesn't have a water bowl, unless it's contraindicated. So making sure that we're um, giving them an antiemetic so they have rapid access to oral water, making sure we're using aggressive fluid therapy. Most of my poisoning cases are on two and a half to three and a half times maintenance, making sure we're hemodiluting them. Now, I will say, I think that ASPCA overhypes how often you have to check electrolytes when you're giving charcoal to a dog or a cat. They usually say um, two to three times a day. To me, that's honestly overkill. Um, I think once a day is totally sufficient. But again, I usually give them a water bowl, meropotent, and aggressive fluid therapy. What I do think is important in every hospitalized patient is when they're on IV fluids, they should get a daily PCV total solids. And please excuse the typo, that should say, PCV of 35%, total solids of five. In any normal healthy patient, when they come in, say it's a Labrador, it got into bromethylene, you treat them in the hospital, you get baseline blood work, his PCV is 45 and seven. He better be hemodilute to a PCV of 35 and five by the end of the day or the end of your shift. Why? Because if he's still 45 and seven, 24 hours later, it means you're meeting his maintenance, but you're not actually hemodiluting him. They have done cardiac output studies in um, rat and mice models, and they found that you are most hemodilute and you have the highest cardiac output when you're hemodilute because your blood is less sludgy. So the ideal PCV total solids is 35 and 5. The ideal uh, urine-specific gravity is 10, 15 to 10, 18 once they've been on fluids. So really important that we're making sure that we're hemodiluting our patients, especially if they got into a nephrotoxicant. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, briefly on when else are we going to give charcoal. Now, rel relatively safe to give charcoal, but keep in mind it only binds to certain things. It only binds to nonpolar compounds well, and it doesn't usually bind to liquids well. It doesn't bind to oily things. It doesn't bind to things on the periodic table well. Um, it does not bind to alcohol, xylitol, or heavy metals. And I always joke, Activated charcoal doesn't bind to things that end with an all. So alcohol, xylitol, heavy metals don't bind to charcoal. So don't torture your technicians and make them give charcoal with these scenarios. Again, not common for charcoal to bind. It's not worth giving in this scenario. All right, last aspect that I wanted to talk about, and then we'll open it up to questions. How do we make the visit less stressful for a cat? Well, first of all, if you're gonna refer it, and you haven't decontaminated the cat yet, feel free to give 100 megs of gabapentin orally. <laughs> um, try to implement uh, more fear-free. So if an owner uh, has a gabapentin at home, or please make sure your owners have lots of gabapentin, um, that they administer the 100 megs of gabapentin, especially if it's a reactive cat. Um, hopefully you guys are doing that for your feline patients that are reactive, 100 megs the night before the appointment, another 100 megs, um, ideally two hours before the appointment, as long as they don't have um, CNS disease or renal disease. If you gave that cat dexmedetomidine to induce emesis, if it's already sedate, please don't reverse it yet. Keep Get that IV catheter in. After they vomited, give it one mg per kg of IV. Make sure to tube it to give it charcoal uh, with a plastic mouth gag if needed. Um, now, I will, I, you can see that I wrote intubate here. Um, I, when I gastric lavage, I don't intubate. Um, I always teach that you guys should intubate if you're not 100% sure where that oral gastric tube is. Anesthesiologists will tell you you should intubate um, so you can protect the airway, inflate the endotracheal tube so they don't aspirate. Um, in general, I don't uh, when I gastric lavage, and knock on wood, I've had uh, no complications from it, but I do warn owners about the risks of sedation and the rare risks of. Um, developing aspiration pneumonia. Uh, create the mood. Once they're sedate, you can partially reverse them. If they're cardiovascularly stable, I don't always reverse them. Uh, we have a specific great, quiet, dark cat ward. So comfortable bedding, adding in a cardboard box. Um, so they have a hide spot, making sure that you're going slowly, you're using uh, feel away or whatever products. It's quiet. They're, they're not in a room with a barking dog. Um, so when in doubt, try to make the um, visit as um, peaceful and stress-free as possible for that poisoned cat. Um, in conclusion, obviously we all know cats are different from dogs, but even more so with poisoning. Remember, 
only 10% of the calls to ASPCA are, are feline patients. But we do have to keep, them, keep in mind that because of their altered glucuronidation, their limited sulfation, their um, eight sulfhydryl groups versus four uh, sulfhydryl groups, their idiosyncratic drug reactions are much more at risk for developing more serious toxicity as compared to dogs. Remember, we cannot use apomorphine or hydrogen peroxide in cats. Instead, we should be using dexmedetomidine or an alpha adrenergic drug or potentially 0.1 mg per kg sub Q of hydromorphone. And please don't be scared to use charcoal in cats. Uh, most of the time, people are too hesitant to do it, but it can be life saving. So make sure you feel comfortable tubing a cat. If you just euthanized a cat, it'd be a good time to practice. When in doubt, contact the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center for life-saving advice. Make sure to treat these feline patients that are poisoned aggressively. The prognosis for any poison patient is excellent with symptomatic supportive care. Remember, less than nine, uh, less than 10% uh, of our poisonings actually have an antidote. The rest is going to be symptomatic supportive care. I always say it's six answers to toxicology. It's decontamination. It's fluid therapy to help vasodilate the renal vessels or maintain blood pressure or flush out the toxicant or to perfuse them. It's gastrointestinal support, using drugs like antiemetics after you gave an emetic agent, using anti-ulcer medications or antacids if they got into something corrosive or if they're uremic or if they're in liver failure and have high gastrin levels, making sure to use appropriate neurologic support like methocarbamol, muscle relaxants, anticonvulsants like phenobarbital or IV diazepam, cardiovascular support, reaching for antihypertensives or drugs like atropine to increase or decrease the heart rate if appropriate, using miscellaneous medications like um, superheptidine as a serotonin antagonist if they got into an SSRI, using vitamin K if they got into that rare anticoagulant rodenticide, using SAMe if they got into a hepatotoxicant. And honestly, those are all my answers to toxicology. With that, uh, I wanted to make you aware of a couple of free resources out there. ASPCA has a great app uh, that's totally free that has a chocolate calculator, a bromethylene calculator, a cholecalciferol calculator, a uh, great for pet owners to have too. And with that, I'm happy to open the floor up to any questions that might be out there. Dr. Lee, are you able to see the questions? Um, I can see a couple of them. The first one is, do you palpate the tube in the esophagus dorsal to the trachea when gavaging? Great question. I will say in a dog, I will try to do that. Um, so if you uh, are gastric lavaging a dog, again, ideally you should intubate them, inflate the endotracheal tube, and then there's no way you can pass a huge oral gastric tube into the wrong um, tube because you already have an endotracheal tube in place. If you don't intubate them, then yes, I always want to confirm that the tube is in the right um, hole. I want to make sure it's in the esophagus. So I will blow into the tube. Um, a lot of times I'll get that gastric gas coming back. Um, the second thing I'll do is I'll escalt over the stomach while I'm blowing into the tube hard to listen for some um, bubbling. And then the third thing I'll do is I'll palpate the uh, cervical area to palpate for two tubes. That can be hard in a really thick neck, huge German Shepherd. Um, in general, if you feel one tube rattling inside another tube, you're probably in your trachea. So uh, yes, ideally, I don't think it works as well in cats. Tiger lilies are not the same as day lilies. Uh, day lilies are not all lilium or hemorrhalis. Uh, tiger lilies, again, tall, spindly, ugly. Uh, most people don't cut them and bring them inside, uh, but they're different species. Um, chocolate is probably toxic to cats. It is a theobromine that is toxic, but honestly, cats just don't gorge unless it's your own veterinary nurse's cat. And then of course they eat a whole container of raisinets. <laughs> so I've had that happen. But in general, most cats won't gorge on uh, food products. So it is probably toxic. It's just that they don't ingest enough to be an issue. Um, great question. How do you get that small dose of dextomator into a cat? You can pre-dilute it. We usually use an insulin syringe to, to get it. I believe Zoetis carries two concentrations of dexmedetomidine, so you can always buy uh, the easier to draw up concentration that is less concentrated. Um, yes, 
dried dehydrated tiger lilies are used in Chinese stir fry and they taste disgusting. So again, super safe for human to eat. Uh, they taste gross and rubbery, just like you would imagine. But that reiterates why you can't call a human poison control because you're trying to save the owner money. Human poison controls are federally or state funded. Actually, they're usually state funded. Um, and unfortunately, most human um, medical professionals don't know about species differences. So yes, tiger lilies, uh, Easter lilies, all these um, are presumptively safe for humans, uh, just dangerous to cats, to our feline patients. Feel free to ask any questions. I'm happy to open up the floor to any of these questions. I always joke, ask me today because it's 65 bucks tomorrow. And I apologize that my um, webcam wasn't working, but hopefully you guys could all hear me okay. Let's see. We have a raised hand, just a second here. Sure. I'm gonna let her speak. Sure. Go ahead, Karen. Karen? Karen, if you want to type into the Q&A box, then we should be able to see your question. Um, dish soap, sodium lauryl sulfate. Everyone's so scared of a lot of these chemicals that are used. It's very interesting. So everyone tries to go very natural. Um, and I will say a lot of these products are not gonna be a big deal to cats. Um, so regular dish soap uh, should be fine. I will say I had a horrible, horrible experience where um, a cat owner was told that their cat got into a pyrethro had a pyrethroid applied and they were told to bathe the cat and the pet owner used dishwasher liquid cascade. That is corrosive. Um, so you do have to be very careful, especially with cat owner, with pet owners. So I usually say, um, if I'm triaging a call, I'll say, make sure you bathe them with uh, liquid dish soap, something like Dawn, what you use to wash dishes in the sink, not dish detergent. Um, so again, dish soap, totally fine. Not going to be a big deal at all. Um, one other free clue that I wanted to leave you guys with, when in doubt, I always educate pet owners, pre-program your cell phone um, with your clinic, your vet clinic, the AERC and the ASPC Animal Poison Control Center because pet owners are freaked out. Uh, remember, there's going to be a lot big change with telemedicine with COVID-19, um, where telemedicine is now um, allowed in certain states because of that. But in general, we at ARC, like if a pet owner that we've never seen before calls and says, hey, my dog got into this, can you know what should I do? We can't give them advice. ASPCA, human poison control centers can because they're covered by the Good Samaritan law. Um, but in general, please make sure your front desk staff know they can't just give random advice if they don't have a established medical record with that, that pet owner. Um, so that's one important thing. But there's a lot of free information. So um, the ASPCA app, again, has great information. Uh, one way that I always advocate for is, again, that Purdue EPA regulation number will give you a lot of information. And again, anything that kills anything always has an EPA regulation number on it. So you can always find the product. Um, my next free clue is VIN. I'm a, in full disclosure, I'm also a toxicology consultant on VIN. Um, they answer a ton of toxicology questions, not always timely, so don't always rely on that. But my next clue is always request a faxed copy or an email copy of your ASPCA report and then put it into a binder. And that way you always have that information readily available and just make sure it's alphabetized so you have that info. Um, so those are my, my biggest clues that uh, really, really help with the poisoning case. You've got a couple more questions, Dr. Lee. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> Great question. What's the toxic agent in grapes? We have no idea. In fact, if you really want to know, I used to peel my childhood Pekingese uh, 
his prednisone in a green grape every day of his life for 13 years, and he never had an issue with it. Um, it wasn't until 2001 that ASPCA published um, in a paper by Ubig and all, in conjunction with University of Illinois, that grapes and raisins and anything in the vitis species is poisonous. ASPCA believes that the baking or heating process denatures the toxicant, but honestly, oh, we don't even know what the toxicant is. Um, it is not a uh, um, toxicant that causes crystal urea. So it's not like ethylene glycol. It doesn't cause calcium oxide crystals. There's a lot of hypotheses out there. My hypothesis of why vitis species is poisonous is that it's a salicylate-like aspirin-like compound. That's why drinking red wine is good for you. Um, I believe that it um, probably is salicylate-like and causes a vasospasm to the renal vessels. 50%, according to ASPCA, 50% of dogs that get into raisins and grapes never have an issue. A recent published uh, study that just came out of Michigan State Vet School found that less than 10% of patients ever developed azotemia. Um, so I think that's because we decontaminate really well, and I think it's probably idiosyncratic. Please keep in mind that when the Ubig and All paper originally came out in 2001, they said there was a toxic dose. There is not a toxic dose that's been debunked. Uh, my general rule is more than a handful is toxic. Uh, small chihuahua eats one or two grapes, I would decontaminate it. Um, so I always tell people with any toxicant, the sooner you identify it, the cheaper it is, the better the prognosis. Owner has limited funds, at least hospitalize it aggressively for 24 hours. Uh, prognosis is way better. Um, if uh, ASPCA did note that dogs that vomit are more likely to have issues with grapes and raisins. So you decontaminate it, you send it home, the dog vomits, it needs to be seen right away. That patient needs to be treated. Um, I see another question on vaping. Yes, I have seen uh, vaping poisoning in a cat. <clears throat> it was a cat that knocked over a vaping a cartridge. The owner knew exactly how, how much nicotine was in there. Um, so yes. The liquid is poisonous, but if you've ever dipped or smoked a cigarette, um, you will see clinical signs right away. You'll get a nicotine buzz within 15 minutes. So dog comes in, was exposed to a vaping liquid, happened an hour ago, dog's totally normal, normal on physical exam. It's probably not going to be an issue. Um, but when in doubt, yes, it does contain nicotine. Um, Rarely, you have to make sure it doesn't contain THC. So just be aware of that. Um, but with nicotine, again, you'll see clinical signs right away. You're almost going to treat it like a really, really bad um, theobromine toxicity. So just be aware uh, the clinical signs that are seen with nicotine, agitation, tremoring, hypertension, you can actually see seizures with it. Um, very, very rarely, there are fatalities that have been reported from dogs eating a whole pack of um, unsmoked cigarettes. So please be aware of that. The, the LD50 is low. It's typically uh, less than 12 mg per kg. So you do want to uh, treat it pretty aggressively. You can see clinical signs at really low ingestions. So typically I say uh, anything above one to four mg per kg is going to be an issue. In the cat that I saw, the cat had broken the bottle probably ingested some. There was some on the ground. Um, it was an hour out. The cat was completely asymptomatic. So honestly, we didn't even treat it. But yes, can definitely be a poison. And please be aware, you can definitely see a THC or pot um, also. Um, when do you use a second dose of charcoal? Great question. Um, in cats and dogs, I usually say six hours out. So um, in general, Charcoal has to bind to the toxicant to actually work. So if your toxicant's in your jejunum and you're just giving your char charcoal into the stomach now, it's never going to work. It's never going to physically touch the toxicant unless it undergoes enterohepatic recirculation. So um, no hard, fast rule. I'd say four to six hours. If the cat's still sedate at four hours, go for it. <laughs> uh, but in general, I, I usually do every six hours for three to four doses in dogs, ideally two doses in cats. Any other questions, feel free to type them in. 
Otherwise, uh, thank you guys so much for joining us for today's Animal Emergency and Referral Center uh, seminar. And I know Heidi probably has some last points to bring up, um, but otherwise enjoy the beautiful 60 degree day before it snows again. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, those of you who attended um, Dr. Lee's uh, December talk via webinar know that she and I are uh, a tragic combination when it comes to technology. So <laughs> yeah, <your> patience today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as I said previously, um, we will have a CE certificate to you within 10 to 14 days. If you don't receive it by then, definitely email me because sometimes my email um, does not communicate well with others. And um, thank you all for attending today and uh, stay healthy. We um, really hope that everybody's doing well in their clinics and staff are staying healthy. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone.